Good afternoon, folks. Welcome back to Advanced Higher Chemistry. We are having a look today at equilibria. Uh, the plural of equilibrium, of course. And uh, I'll just move my glass of water. That's a prop for later on. Um, I'm covering the contents here from SQA, course spec specification document. That's 64 to 66. And the scholar PDF, if you have access to those notes, uh, pages 3 through to 16. These are the three main learning outcomes that we're going to tackle in the video today. I would like to briefly revisit higher chemistry in terms of equilibrium. And I would like to introduce a brand new uh, concept, the equilibrium constant, uh, K. That's what we're going to be dealing with. What does it tell you? How to derive the expression for it and a numerical calculation on how we can actually work out an example of one. And we're going to end this video with <laughs> a nice pun. We're going to end it with a closer look at what happens to my glass of water here. Uh, we did actually tell you something all the way back in National 5, and it turned out to be true for a change. It wasn't all false in that course. So let's push on to the first section. Let's revisit higher and see what we can uh, fill you in with on that. Uh, this is a new phone, by the way, sorry. It'd be interesting to see how the audio and video quality looks. So I've lost the pause button, easy access. I managed to snag myself an old Pixel 4. Oh, dear. Focus, come on. That's because there's no writing. Ah, uh, hold on. Let me fix that. Let's try that now. See if it holds the focus. Okay. Higher. At higher, we told you there were three ways to shift an equilibrium position, whatever that meant. Well, what it meant was which side of the equilibrium was there most chemicals present. When I say side, I mean good old Haber, uh, CH2. I say good old Haber, of course. He was a terrible, terrible human being. Um, so if we have a look at this, if I said the equilibrium lies to the ammonia side, it means the concentration of this is larger than the concentration of these two in the whole equilibrium mixture, of course. Which is what you would try and want if you were running a, a factory to produce ammonia, of course. You want more of the product side, or the right-hand side. There's no such thing as reactants products. They're both interchangeable for equilibria. Uh, so we just said the equilibrium lies to one side or another, and we told you there were three ways to change this position. I'm sorry, two of them were sort of false. Um, and the one that was true uh, was about temperature. Let's just uh, dig up some equilibrium, some enthalpy change figures for these equi for this equilibria. Sorry, excuse me. It's been a long time since I've made one of these videos. I'm stumbling over my words. Right, thought I'd be semi-professional and go and look up the actual number. So the delta H for the Haber process is negative 92 kilojoules per mole. That is traditionally, of course, they always give you just one. That's for the left to right. So this means down here, this will be positive 92 kilojoules per mole. Uh, so uh, we we had a look at temperature, changing the temperature last year. And basically, if you increase the temperature, then you will accelerate the endothermic reaction. Uh, so which one of these two is it? endothermic? If you're not sure, dig it out of your memory. You have to look at it from the molecules point of view. So a positive enthalpy gain, a gain in enthalpy, as in you are the molecule, you are pulling in heat from the surroundings. That is an endothermic reaction. So if we increase the temperature, this backwards reaction here will accelerate. Uh, and which is bad, of course, because that means you shift the position of the equilibrium, as we used to say, over to this side. You'll end up increasing the, quant the concentration of these two and decreasing the concentration of uh, your ammonia, which is why the Haber process is only run about 300 Celsius, which is relatively cold com for chemistry. Um, and the converse statement would be true as well. If you drop the temperature, then you will slow the endothermic reaction. I don't know why I'm doing that in two different lines there. Sorry. Uh, you will slow down the endothermic reaction. So in this case, if you reduce the temperature, you will slow the endothermic, which means the exothermic will continue to run and we'll push the equilibrium, in our case, to the right, which is what we want uh, for the Hubbard process. So as I said, that's why it's done at relatively low temperature. Why not do it minus, minus 60 then? Because 
it takes so long to reach equilibrium at that point. It's, it's a compromise, like most things in life, it's a compromise. So that was a revisit on the only actual true way to shift the equilibrium position left or right from higher. I know we said about pressure and changing, adding or removing a chemical, and they do to a certain extent, but as far as advanced higher is concerned, this is a famous trick question. Uh, let's have a look at uh, the second uh, concept I wanted to do today, which is re uh, which is to introduce an equilibrium constant, a K value. Come on, focus. There we go. So what is an equilibrium constant? It is a number which represents the position of that equilibrium. How do we calculate them? Well, if we had a, a hypothetical equilibrium, which is how all the textbooks show it, A plus B uh, reacts together to make C plus D, which of course also falls apart to make A plus B. And they would have coefficients. So these are the small numbers, of course, that go before um, the big numbers, basically, in a balanced equation. And the letter that we use for equilibrium constants is K. Sometimes gets a little suffix for an important equilibrium. But in general terms, we just call them Ks. Uh, and we calculate it using the following. We calculate it by basically it's it's a ratio of everything on the right, which goes on the top, divided by everything on the left, which goes on the bottom. So it's a, you can see why it tells you which side is larger because there's a num numerator and uh, denominator here. And uh, we get to use the square brackets on our keyboards. How exciting. First time ever because this being chemistry, we deal with concentrations. So what we want is the concentration of C times the concentration of D over the concentration of A times the concentration of B. So it's the concentration of us is at the right hand side divided by the, the concentrations on the left hand side. Why did I bother putting these little numbers in here? Because they are important. And what we have to do is we have to raise each of these concentrations to the power of this coefficient here. Uh, I'll show you exactly what I mean. Uh, going back to Haber again. So the equilibrium constant, this is, by the way, this is the expression for it. Remember I said I was going to do that? Uh, I've told you what it means. It told it. It tells you the position of the equilibrium. I'm showing you how to calculate the expression, the algebraic expression for it, and just very shortly we'll have a look at on how to do an example. So for the Haber process, it would be everything on the right, which is only just one thing, which is ammonia, raised to the coefficient, so squared. So the concentration of ammonia squared divided by the concentration of nitrogen to just the power of one, because it was one nitrogen. And if my short-term memory serves me correctly, it was three hydrogens. So that means that's the concentration of hydrogen gas cubed. So that's the expression for K for the Haber process. I'm uh, just going to pause, uh, set up an actual question, probably based on this actually, just for simplicity, and we'll work out a numerical value of K. Okay, so here's a typical question. Uh, two moles of nitrogen and two moles of hydrogen are put into a sealed chamber and allowed to come to equilibrium. If there are 0 0.6 moles of ammonia present, at the equilibrium of course, calculate K, the equilibrium constant for this system. So let's have a look at this. We've got N2 plus 3H2 makes 2NH3. Now, uh, let's have a look. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have at the side here, I'm going to have the concentration um, at the start. And I'll have the concentration at, so that's at the start, and the concentration once the system has come to its equilibrium. So initially, of course, we have got two of this and two of this, and shockingly, zero, of course, of that, because the had reaction hasn't started yet. Now, the real figures here are the ones we need for this line here, because they are going to be the most important ones. Um, we know that there are 0 0.6 moles um, of ammonia present at the equilibrium point, cause it tells us. Very nice. And all we need to do is work out how many moles we've got of these two chemicals, and then we can feed it into our equilibrium expression that we showed you on the last page, which was this one. 
So once we know these three concentrations, we can just fire them into this equation and out will pop a numerical answer for k. Sorry, that was awful loud. Uh, oh dear, sub-professional editing here, making the paper manky. Sorry about that. Question is, how do we know how the number of moles of this? Another question, just before we calculate that, is didn't you say, Baldy, that you needed the concentration of ammonia and not the actual number of moles of ammonia? Now, the good news is because we are dealing with gases here um, and it's a sealed chamber, then whatever the actual volume is applies to everything. So simply the number of moles scales straight into a concentration. Don't worry about it. We're just going to use the number of moles for this purpose. So how do we work out these two? Well, what we do, uh, folks, is we look at the stoichiometry here. Uh, the big ratios, in other words, 1 to 3 and 1 to 2. So, if we have produced 0 0.6 moles of ammonia, we must have reacted 0 0.3 moles of the nitrogen, because the ratio is 1 to 2. And we know that we started with 2, so we have got 2, this is the number of moles we've got left, it's 2, take away, um, 0 0.3. So 0 0.6 over 2, effectively. Uh, and this one here, um, this is the ratio of 3 to 2. So if we have produced 0 0.6 moles here, we need 1.5 times this, because that's the ratio, if we're going that way. 3 is 1.5 times 2. So we have got 2, take away uh, 1.5 times 0 0.6. So just run through that again. We started with 2 and 2 and 0. What we really need to know is the moles at equilibrium, because once we know that, we can feed it into our expression and calculate the k value. And we actually work backwards from this. This was the main source here. So if we had 0 0.6 moles of this, we must have used up um, 1.5 times 0 0.6. So uh, 6 fives are 3, so z... Um, yeah, 0 0.9. So 2 take away 0 0.9. <laughs> I should just check this, shouldn't it? That would be embarrassing. So 2 take away 0 0.9 is 1.1. Uh, and 2 take away 0 0.3, effectively, um, is 1.7. So these are the moles of three chemicals at equilibrium point, which means we can feed them into our little, little expression, which was the concentration of ammonia to the power of 2, because that's the coefficient in the expression. So that will be 0 0.6 squared over um, 1.7, just to the power of 1, times 1.1 uh, cubed. I will need a calculator for that one, though. Okay, I'll just go and steal my son's calculator. We get... Um, Uh, 0.6 uh, squared divided by 1.1 uh, times 1.1 times 1.1. I can't quite see where the cube button is, and I don't have my specs on, so we'll just do it that way. Uh, we get 0 0.159 to three significant figures. So that's the value of k. So... Where are we on my initial um, my initial learning outcomes? We wanted to revisit higher and talk about temperature, which we did. Uh, we want to introduce the equilibrium constant K. What does it tell you? Oh, yeah, values of K, sorry. Yes, uh, value of K. Well, K in a perfectly balanced reaction, I'm hoping you could figure out if the top and the bottom of our dividers were identical to each other, then K would be 1. That would be a 50-50 reaction, if there is such a, ever such a thing. I doubt it very much. If you end up with K having a value of something like 1 times 10 to the, say, 6, you know, like a million, a ridiculously high value of K, that means this side here is enormous. So um, if, let's put on this piece of paper, if K is, say, very large, say 1 times 10 to the 6, then there is very much more of the right-hand side chemicals present. If K is approximately equal to 1, then it's pretty much balanced, 
And lastly, of course, if you get a value of k, not negative, but very small, it can be a negative number, but it can be a very small number, so say 1 times 10 to the minus 6, then there is very much more of the left-hand side present compared to the right-hand side chemicals. Happy with that, guys? What am I asking that for? That's what I would normally say in the classroom. I can't tell if you're happy or not as a watcher. <laughs> I have no idea if you're happy or not. Hopefully go back and watch the video again if you're not happy. So that's these three taken care of there, uh, guys. There is one, one last thing before we leave the expression of an equilibrium constant. And it sort of ties in very nicely with this, my glass of water, which I have, in fact, finished. Let's have a look at the weirdness of water. Okay, uh, let's have a look at this water molecule minding its own business here, apparently, and doing nothing much. And, oh, look, next door to it, there just happens to be another water molecule. Uh, that's handy, since there's more than a few in my glass. Now, we told you uh, at National 5, we wrote it down like this. Water reacts, well, not reacts, water falls apart to make a hydrogen ion and a hydroxide ion. And those two are also, we said it was a reversible reaction. Oh, look, it's an equilibrium. Just exactly what we're doing. That's a stroke of luck. Uh, now, we said this in National 5, and it turns out that that wasn't actually false. Uh, it wasn't even massively dumbed down, but there's something here that we're not filling you in with. Uh, let's have a look at this. This is a nice callback to higher as well, because if you remember correctly, the shared pair of electrons in this bond here does not sit in the middle. The electronegativity, the pulling power of oxygen, is seriously larger than hydrogen. In fact, this bond is so polarised it gets its own name, of course. This is a hydrogen bond. So the pair of electrons is very much there. And it's entirely possible that they could just go bunk onto that oxygen, which of course would end up making what well, looks like this. It would make a hydrogen ion and a hydroxide ion. The thing about this, though, is this would just be a single proton floating about in your glass of water. It doesn't sound very stable to me. There's a thing in physics called point charge, where um, it doesn't have to be of a relatively large charge, but as long as it's a very small point. It's why electrical sparks jump off pointy things, not smooth things. I'm not going to go into that too much, that's physics. But just bear with me. This can't survive on its own, okay? It can exist in a glass of water on its own. Fortunately, though, passing by, as I said, is a water molecule with its two pairs of non-bonded electrons. And what can happen here is that these two electrons here can just grab a hold of this passing hydrogen ion, and we can, in fact, make this. Now, we know that this is OH-, this is the hydroxide ion. This, H3O, if you do the sums, has in fact got one more proton than electron in the whole molecule, so therefore it also has a charge, and that is the true representation of a hydrogen ion. This has even got a name. It's called hydronium, which is in the SQA documentation, so they want you to know it. So this is the hydronium ion, and this is the true face of acids. This is actually what is in acids that do their acid -y thing. So this is the actual equilibrium that's going on here. It's actually two water molecules reacting with each other to form a hydronium, hydrogen plus ion, and hydroxide ion. The thing we told you at National 5, why is water uh, neutral? That still stands because the concentration of the hydrogen ions is equal to the concentration of the hydroxide ions. They're equal numbers and therefore equal concentrations in my glass of water here, which means it is indeed still neutral. And so is this. But this is the true nature of the equilibrium. This was the simplified one, this is the true one. How would we write the expression for that then? How would you write the K for it in fact? So, um, we're going to have a look at our last part here, the ionic product. That's of water, by the way, though. Uh, it's also got its own name, sometimes called dissociation constant, as in dissociating, as in the, wa the water molecules are falling apart. 
Uh, it's, it's so important, in fact, it's got its own uh, physical constants actually in your data book. I think last page, if I remember correctly, along with all the other physical constants, KW. It's got its own letter as well. Let's have a look at how you would represent it. Technically speaking, it's actually this 2H2O uh, reacting with each other, going to form H3O. Look, I'm being semi-professional here. I'm actually using the physical st uh, state symbols, which I don't normally do because I'm lazy. Um, so this, you would expect then, KW, to be concentration of the hydronium ions times the concentration of the hydroxide ions. Both of these are to the power of one, of course, because there's just one of each, all over the concentration of water squared. Focus. Come on, camera. There we go. Uh, if you can tell me what the concentration of water is in water, then I will eat my hat that I'm not wearing. Uh, so there is a thing in physical chemistry where it's a bit of a bodge, in my opinion, but it avoids the problems of trying to cal cal calculate the concentration of pure liquids or pure solids, in fact. So what we do is we just replace it with one. So the expression for Kw, the ionic product or the dissociation constant of water, is this. It's simply the concentration of H3O times the concentration of hydroxide. That's it. There is no bottom line. So they just replace the bottom line with one. This doesn't get invited to the equilibrium constant party, which seems a bit harsh to me. Uh, and it is 1.01 .01 times 10 to the minus 14, according to your SQA data book. Uh, let's take a second to realize that. Minus 14. That's quite small. Uh, and it actually features nicely back to something from National 5. I don't know if you're certainly at Melbourne. Um, we actually... I, I try and demonstrate the fact that pure water does actually conduct electricity not very well. If you crank the voltage up to 13 volts, you might get oh, a whole 5 microamps through it. That's uh, like 1 times 10 to the minus 6 of an amp. Uh, and here's the reason why. I know there are some ions in my glass of water, but this is negative 14. That means for every one pair of ions here, there are... 1 times 10 to the positive 14 molecules. What's that, 100 million million molecules for every one pair of ions? That's why that's minus 14. Um, so, yeah, your glass of water is mostly molecules. That's totally true. But there are enough ions present to A, conduct electricity a tiny bit, a, and B, enable it to do all these wonderful things like dissolving ionic compounds, which is ever so important, you know, to life on Earth, as we know it. Um, so I just said to have, would I have a little, little look at the deep dive into the weirdness of water? I've lost my learning outcomes. How unprofessional. There we go. So, very quick summary. Um, guys, revisiting higher uh, in terms of the temperature, introducing a cyclobrium constant, telling us these three things, and one last look specifically at the dissociation constant or ionic product of water. We will come back um, probably in the next video, actually, and we'll have a look at acids and bases. We'll have a look at our current definition of an acid and base. We'll give it a fancy name, because the SQA won't use the fancy name. And then we'll move on to... Um, something called strong and weak acids. In the meantime, thank you for listening. Bye-bye.